So welcome everybody. This is sorry. Yeah. Welcome everybody. This is the butterfly talks. So I'll read a text just for you to kind of have a little bit of an idea of what the intention of the session is, and then I'll introduce um, what we what we'll be doing. So butterflies are not only extremely elegant and beautiful, they also serve important roles in the ecosystems that they are a part of. Perhaps most significantly significantly pollinating important food, crops, and flowers. Over the past four decades, butterfly populations have been decreasing, with many species, species including the monarch, inching closer to extinction. As with the butterfly, many other of our sacred species, traditions, languages, culture are going extinct. In these talks, we will hear from individuals and groups that are working to re-enliven, and reconnect, and re-engage through acts of education. Although these projects will be shared individually, they are part of a larger, larger distributed global movement. Each of these actions are significant with impact and effects, and effects far beyond. These talks are organized to connect, share, inspire, and spread these butterfly effects wider for the sake of revitalizing sorry, our human and non-human ecosystems. So that's a little bit of the intention of the session. And before going into the conversations, I'd like to introduce uh, the four panelists that will be talking. So um, yeah, John Duval, Fabienne Veilis. I don't know if you pronounce that, have I pronounced that correctly? You can correct me if you feel like it. And Thais Mantovani and myself. So I will, what I'll do is just give a little bit of an introduction of who is who before they start their talk. And because I'm the first in person, I'll just give you a little bit of introduction of who I am or what I'm here for. So what I've decided to share about myself is that I rather listen than speak. I like accompanying people going through difficult times and I'm better acquainted with silence and meaningful conversations than with small talk. And of course, I love to joke and listen to people's imprudent and gentle occurrences. So that being said, I'm happy to share my talk, which is called Death, Play and Mushrooms. So just to relax the expectations a little bit, I just want to share that this is an idea that I'm still developing. It's kind of a concept that is being, that's going on through my mind. It's not a concrete project. It's not a concrete workshop. It's not a concrete book. It's not a play for now. And the idea of this space is to attempt to explore what it might be like to exist differently within ourselves. So how can we envision having different systems of education if our structures continue to be rigid and not flexible? And in order to kind of explore this question, I've invited three elements. The element of death, the element of play, and mushrooms. And I'll tell you a little, a little bit about each of them. So the idea here is to invite death consciousness as their teacher in order to help us explore what it might feel like to let go, even if for a second or an hour of our accustomed, of our accustomed way, ways of being and existing within ourselves. The idea is to explore that space in between, the space in between stories, the space in between one thought and the other, the space in between letting go of a bodily form and getting going into another, and start to, in that space in between, envision different options of existing. And that's when play comes in. So the idea is that play will come in and present us with different options. So we imagine or try to, kind of feel that space when your body's kind of contracting, relaxing and starting to contract again. It's that space in between the contraction and the relaxation that play comes in and offers different options. So that may, might be different ways of breathing, different ways of talking to our rel relatives, different ways of relating with the natural world. It's quite open at the moment. And kind of hand in hand with play comes come mushrooms. And mushrooms are invited into the space more 
with an idea of kind of serving as muses or as, as inspiration and also to have the role of witnessing. So I'm not kind of, I'm not really inviting in this space for people to consume mushrooms in a psychedelic way. Of course, you're free to do that, but that's not the intention of mushrooms. It's just kind of to understand the intelligence of the natural world when we're trying to kind of learn from the natural, natural world. Because mushrooms are, I mean, not according to me, according to people that study them, study them one of the most intelligent um, yeah, creatures in nature. And one of the things or the, the, the characteristics that make them so intelligent is their capacity to kind of understand their environment and adapt their functioning to what might be required in a certain moment. So if the floor is kind of really, really full of leaves and, and, and mulch, then mushrooms kind of put on their decomposing hat and say like what needs to be done now before passing nutrients from one, from one plant to the other is start decomposing this matter. So I, actually we have the nutrients that are effectively available for transporting um, this information. So what does that mean for us? Well, the analogies that I make might be a bit far off or far-fetched for some of you. I'm still, as I said, exploring this idea, but decomposing our ways of being might be, might entail or might, might look like relinquishing patterns of thought, patterns of relationship, unlearning a lot of the things we've learned theoretically and in practice. So that's kind of one of the possibilities that mushroom off, mushrooms off, um, have to offer. And also the, the reason why I'm bringing in mushrooms into the conversation is because for many indigenous uh, groups or culture, cultures especially, or what I've, the ones that I've studied the most are the Hopi group in Venezuela. So they, the mushrooms are kind of part of their central way of, of conceiving the world. So mushrooms for them are not just something that you consume, but more like the spirit, spirits. And what I'm kind of inspired to bring or to share is that according to the Hopis, before trying to consume mushrooms or handle them in any way, you're supposed or invited to go through some kind of rituals and initiations. So the idea is that before even attempting, attempting sorry, to connect with the natural world, the invitation is to witness it, to listen to it. And then once kind of that process of, of, of releasing our sometimes pervasive need to consume and to grasp and to possess and not then to dissect, we take a little bit of a, of a, of a well, we take some steps backwards we witness, we start to understand and practice different ways of listening and relating, and then we're invited to relate to the natural world. So, as I said, this is still a little bit of a place of exploration, and the, but the reason what I, why I think I wanted to present this idea here is because we're talking about creating different universities, different knowledges, different ways of relating to the natural world. And sometimes, or many, <clears throat> many talks, we've heard, and I completely agree, that we should look back to traditional and ancestral wisdom as something to kind of guide ourselves by. And I think that's a completely legitimate approach. But what sometimes I'm a little bit kind of angsty about is the fact that we're looking, or some of us might be looking to these knowledges and, and, and wisdom it, with that kind of same mentality, like, oh, that ancestral knowledge, I take it, I incorporate it, and then I'm done. And we're not kind of letting that kind of sink in changes and talk to us in the ways that I think are necessary for us to kind of re-relate with the natural world. Because I find so that sometimes we're doing like very big claims about embodying learning, but there's the space for that learning to happen is still not, not there. And this is what I, I would like eventually for this death play and mushrooms project to be. For it to be a space in which we can practice these different ways of being in a way that feels safe, that's not only theoretical, and in a place that inquires, yeah, that, that what the in-between stories might mean for each of us in our relationships, in the way that we in the ways that we consume, in the ways that we witness. And that's a little bit of the invitation that I'd like to make to you today. I'm a little bit nervous, but this is just a first approach first idea 
all feedback is welcome. Friend already told me like, Marcella, that's too ambitious and confusing. So I'm very open to all type of feedback and I'm happy to um, yeah, receive your questions at the end of the panel. So that being said, I'll introduce John Duval, our next speaker. And yeah, so John is a prof former prof professor, sorry, of communications and media studies at Ellen University and Dominican University of California, MFA in cinema production, PhD in Transforms transformative studies, active in transition town movements for 15 years, and current participant in transition schools initiative, auth author of the environmental documentary, Cinema Activism in the 21st Century. And I think that with that, I'll pass it on to you, John. Thank you. Okay, uh, just let me tell, get my, here, I'm, I'm not muted, right? Okay, let me uh, share my screen. Um, okay, uh, I, I love the way Marcella's uh, uh, presentation is so so individual, personal, and interior. I'm going to be on the total opposite end of the scale, except I think you'll see at the end that we kind of converge in some important ways. Um, my topic is the landscape of post-collapse education. And besides my academic uh, history there, I want to mention that I've been a long time associate of the Post Carbon Institute and the Transition uh, Network. Uh, so a lot of my ideas come out of that. Um, uh, let me see. Uh, let's see if I'm, okay, there, good. Okay, so collapse. Um, here, wait a minute. I hope I can, uh, uh, Give me one second here to see if I can get get out of the uh, uh, get into a better share thing here. John, uh, if you look at the in the bottom right hand corner, that should be oh the full screen. Over, well, a little over to the left, the little presenty one. Keep on going. Okay. Oh, no, over to the, yeah, right there. Right that, there. Yeah, that should be okay. Yeah, great. that's it. That's it. Thanks very much. Sure. Like I say, first time for everything. Uh, so uh, first of all, I'm gonna spend about half the time talking about my vision of collapse and what that means. And the second half of it talking about impact on education. Uh, Nate Hagens refers to collapse as the great simplification. When we think about collapse, this is the Roman forum from 2000 years ago. This is our sort of uh, touchstone of the concept of collapse. And collapse uh, happens has happened many, many times in many different civilizations. And so uh, uh, I'm, I'm informed a lot by, by uh, Hugo Bardi and Joseph Tainter and some of the scholars of collapse over the years. And uh, collapses always share some things in similarity and they're also very different in other ways. So I'm gonna look at some of the ways that our situation is unique. Uh, first of all, uh, we've got about at least four different crises that are uh, collapsing on us at one time here. Uh, peak oil and peak fossil fuels is one, which is going to deprive us of a lot of the energy we use to run our civilization and our technology. Climate change, of course, is another, which is, is uh, threatening the uh, extinction of half of the species on Earth, including possibly and potentially our own. Um, Overpopulation and inequality is a serious problem worldwide, partly because the population has expanded so much during the fossil fuel era. And un unsustainable debt is another problem which uh, comes into view because, uh, you know, we, if, we, if the economy doesn't continue to grow, our debts, national and individual, will never be paid off. Um, okay, so... So right away, I see that my advancing oh, here, this is probably, yeah, there we go. So our, our societies are very complex, self-organized networks and, and involve uh, various nations, various companies, various consumer groups, of course, energy products. And you pull one or two, three, one or two of these things out of this sort of uh, uh, hutch or yurt, and the whole thing falls apart. And so uh, it's very likely that with all the different things I just mentioned, we're going to be in serious trouble in the near future, if not already. 
one aspect, and I, I'll mention my, my presentation is mostly United States centric because that's where I live, but the things that I'm saying, I think apply pretty much across the board worldwide. Uh, Harvard's, Harvard Business School professor Clayton Christensen says that within the next 10 years, 50% of colleges and universities in the US could go bankrupt or close. Um, so the infrastructure, the educational infrastructure that we rely on to teach our population um, is under serious threat. And that's gonna have impacts down the line on the way people learn and teach. Um, so my, my, I, I think I'm taking it as a, as a, as a, as a as a, an assumption that most of our large national governments will probably collapse because they won't have the resources to function and that we'll have a very, very great reorganization of our government and our societies and cultures. This is the U.S. Uh, bioregions map, which shows how the, how the uh, different parts of the country are, are constituted environmentally in terms of climate and population and so on. And so I'm guessing that these bioregions are gonna serve as governmental units in some form in the future. And even within these bioregions, you've got a lot of smaller watersheds. And I think the central communities of the future will be built around these watersheds. Um, I'm working with a group that uh, is developing an idea called Rural Resilient Hubs. It's rural because I think that most of the uh, highly populated urban centers will probably depopulate as, as the society collapses and people will go out into the countryside for security, just as they did when the Roman Empire collapsed and the cities collapsed. Um, and so I, uh, this, this particular picture, I believe, is of the Eco Village in Ithaca in New, northern New York. Uh, but uh, and, and eco villages or intentional communities is one way to go or establish small towns and cities make continue to uh, exist in the same space, but it's mostly smaller communities with more control over the uh, of their own economy and, and society. Uh, okay, where's the, here we go. Um, so I, I borrowed from Jim Bendel an idea uh, called deep adaptation, and that certainly bears on education. And there are four R's. Resilience involves what do we want to keep? What are the essential parts of our society that we don't want to sacrifice, that we feel like we need to maintain a decent quality of living? Relinquishment is what can we do away with? What can we let go of? Maybe cars, maybe uh, bank, large banks. You know, what, what can we let go of that, that we don't really need to enjoy a decent quality of life? Restoration involves the, the values and skills and behaviors that have been lost. Uh, you know, back in the 19th, 18th centuries, uh, societies would get together to do barn raising to help all their neighbors build their build up their barns and, and the ability to do things like uh, repair clothes, uh, which people used to do individually. And now we farm out to some company to do or we just buy something new. So restoration, a lot of things in the past need to be brought back. And lastly, reconciliation, and that involves the social part of it, the people. Uh, how will we find new ways to live in societies that may be eth ethnically different or uh, uh, politically diverse or so on and so forth? We need a certain um, tools to make the societies come together in a peaceful and cooperative way. Uh, Sustainability, we define in these three categories, environmental, which involves pollution and resource use, uh, economics, which involves uh, uh, jobs, economic growth and development, and, and financial systems, and then social, which involves uh, uh, things like social equality and education, standard of living, and so on. Um, now, the group that I'm working with uh, is trying is looking to develop uh, uh, what we call a triple helix model of innovation, which involves a lot of close collaboration, much more so than in the present, between governments and educational institutions and commerce or industry, uh, because we think that the solutions to how to how to how to live in this new world of collapse is going to require a lot more. Uh, close interaction and development between these sectors than we have currently. Um, and part of this, and this is about the only technological thing I'm gonna say, we really value 
the the, uh, the the online access to communication and information that exists in our in our grid these days with the internet. And I'm not sure that the grid, the larger grid, the internet is going to survive collapse, but we think it's possible for local communities to set up their own, through, through the use of renewable energy, their own microgrids that will still enable smaller communities to function and grow. And we hope that that's the case. Um, the new economy in these communities is gonna be what we call a circular economy, which means most of the resources and most of the production will stay within the community. It uh, involves things like recycling, residual waste, uh, but also on the economic front, things like local banking and local currency uh, to, to try to, to, to sustain the, the growth potential of these smaller communities. Okay, now onto education. Um, the uh, the uh, education is going to be very different in this new world in two ways. Number one, I think it's going to be more based in connection with nature, uh, re uh, referring back to Marcella's presentation. And I think it's also going to involve, uh, a, you know, training for different sorts of jobs, jobs much more hand on in order, in order to preserve the function of the community. So here's some of the thoughts I have on these things. Um, there's a class called Big History, which is a wonderful class I had the opportunity to teach, which tries to compress into one semester the entire history of the universe, from the Big Bang, through the evolution of species, through the evolution of human civilization, and into the, into the present and even the future. And this is a great tool for situating students in the present day. Where, where are we, you know, where, I am, where am I in the ongoing cont continuity of life and, and civilization and development? Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great starting point for helping students situate, situate themselves in the human drama. And a lot of this involves more direct learning in nature, not just with, yeah, within nature. Uh, getting out of the classroom, understanding how the ecosystem of your community works, uh, what, what, how, how species, how we need to interact with species rather than separating ourselves from nature. Uh, a lot of stuff, uh, a lot of this is very live-in, and this can be K through 12 and, and, and up sort of uh, learning. Uh, one particularly uh, specific example of this is the bio, using, using biomimicry in the design of technology systems and social systems. Uh, by looking at how things work and grow in nature, we can help apply some of those lessons to how we construct our societies and our own social interaction. Now, the last part of my talk is going to be about uh, the, uh, the, the, the actual jobs that people are going to be prepared for. And in order to determine this, I look at Maslow's hierarchy of, not, of, of values, which is, starts especially down at the bottom with the psychological needs and the safety needs. Um, rainwater harvesting, you know, water is, water is the most basic thing that we all need within a few days in order to survive. And so rain capture and storage, uh, how to distribute water within a society, these are all things that are gonna require a lot of, uh, a lot of work uh, by, more, by more average citizens and homeowners instead of just you know, uh, huge systems that government organizes. Um, urban permaculture and gardening, uh, uh, food is the second thing on, on Maslow's hierarchy, and we all have to eat every, at least, you know, every few days or we'll starve to death. And this can be done. Uh, the, the, the picture on the right is uh, one of the posters uh, for the victory gardens that were made in the United States during World War I and II, and which I believe provided about 40% of the fruits and vegetables consumed by the United States during that period of, of wartime. So we can do this, you know, we can create a lot of our own food in family gardens and community gardens in, uh, in, in both rural and urban sites. So this is another thing that a lot of people are gonna be doing hands-on work with. Uh, building, of, building of shelter. Uh, this is a picture of one of Michael Reynolds' earth ships from Taos, New Mexico. But, um, you know, build, building in construction will become, I think, a, a community event 
where everybody will contribute to help construct shelters for their fellow communitarians. And those structures are going to be different. The, the structures will be uh, need better retrofitting, better insulation, to so that we're not as reliant on heating, for example, for for uh, for comfort in hard times of, of climate. Um, one of the last things the regional. Just, yeah. uh, just so we can wrap up and make sure we have time for all of the other presentations. Sure. Yeah, I think I've, this is my we next to last. Wrap up. This is my next to last slide. Thank you. Uh, I was in Cuba, and Cuba has a great health system with with very local health centers for regular people and for elders, uh, of, of like a forty to one patient to doctor ratio, which I believe is the lowest in the world. That can be achieved. And lastly, and not not leastly, uh, the healing trauma. When we have a, a collapse, uh, a lot of people, there's a lot of grieving, a lot of loss. People lose partners, families, uh, communities. Uh, so we're, that's part of the educational system is to help people heal from their trauma and, and be, become whole again in order to face the future. Uh, I've got a bibliography and I'll put this on the chat and along with the rest of the presentation. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you, John. That was really, really helpful. It's always helpful for me to see like concrete measures. So just now for the sake of time, I'll introduce Fabienne Baile. I don't know if you pronounce it like that. Uh, you're welcome Bell. to- Veil. Veil. Veil, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So I'll just say a couple of lines that, that I have about you and then you can start if you'd like that. So Fabienne is an educator with over 24 years experience, mother of two boys, podcaster on a mission to change the face of education. So welcome Fabienne and I'll post the link to her project here so you can follow her work. Thank you. Wonderful. Can you all see that? Yes. Wonderful. Right, so today I wanted to talk to you about uh, flourishing education, which is what I've been doing and working on for the last seven years. And I'm really gonna take you on the journey, on that journey of seven years, where in 2014, I uh, rejoined the university in the UK. Um, and to say that I was quite horrified by what I came back to is an understatement. So that drove me to doing more research and to looking into why it is that we say, uh, we adults say that we want our young people to live a happy, fulfilled life. And um, we end up with instead on the ground, stressed out, overwhelmed, uh, busy and completely um, anxious young people. And I would extend to, you know, with systemically with, with that, what happens to us uh, educators as well. Um, and so, I wanted to share tonight with you what my dream is for the future of education, what flourishing education is all about. So I love that John was talking a lot about the um, about nature and the connection, because I'm going to obviously do a lot of connection to nature. I think, first of all, what I would say is that shift in the system. So um, we currently, and I'm going to base um, my, my research on the UK because that's where I live and I'm based um, and we have a system that is very much uh, leading to uncertainty so young people are um, afraid of change and they have a real uncertainty intolerance and they are constantly being tested and what that does when they arrive at universities it sends a message that there is real competitiveness they have to compete with others um, and it's about, you know, dog eat dog, and it's the message that we can't collaborate. And that leads to these young people very, being very, very unhappy when they arrive at university. And most importantly, that leads to the perfectionism we see at university, that fear of failure, imposter syndrome, and what I call comparatitis. So this need to compare themselves to their peers constantly negatively, rather than looking at, um, you know what how they've grown over the years and you know how how they've changed from one day to the next and so really all of this for me is the old paradigm that's the you know the this real competitiveness is the, the you know based on the economy of our grandparents and our great grandparents and i think it has no place in the future of education um 
because really what I saw is what I call flourishing versus languishing, languishing at university. And I think we can draw a lot from nature and return back to connecting to nature rather than thinking that we have to compete and, um, and you know, be, be top dog. And the way we do that is I'd like you to imagine that our institutions or our schools are like gardens and that in those gardens, we don't want all daffodils, all plants that look the same, right? Because even if we wanted daffodils that all look the same, the truth is that even daffodils in the inner field would look different in shape or color or size. So the message we are sending our young people, and I guess we grew up or I grew up with, is that we, it's not okay to be our own individual. So the first thing that I would like to see in my dream is that from a young age, we teach our children to discover what flower, plant, shrub, tree they are in the garden called life and what their fragrance is so that they can really shine and be okay with who they are in that garden and they understand their needs. And then so therefore we would foster that individual plant and flower so they would understand who they are, they would understand their needs and most importantly, they would be authentically themselves in that garden. So that's really something that really excites me at the idea of, you know, tapping not only in, you know, uh, looking at nature and how we can learn from nature, but also sending that message. And then what I would really like to see is, uh, you know, along my journey, what I've tried to do to help our students flourish is initially I focused on the me level, the individual well-being, saying you've got to look after yourself, right? As the plant, you've got to look after yourself. And that's true. Um, if we are a team of gardeners looking after the plant that the student is, then of course they have to take on the nutrients that we are providing as we nourish them right but I think that's not enough and we can't just you know tip that hand says you, if a salad doesn't grow in a in a you know gr grow well then you can't solely blame that salad right so I think this is the image also that I would use here is that if our young people are not happy at university or in their schools then clearly we can't just solely blame them and we also need to move at the next level, which is the we level, the group well-being. Because I, when I interact with an individual or with a group, then you know I affect them and they affect me. But I would also argue that we need to go higher up as well as the us level, the institutional and the societal well-being, looking at how, you know, the environment uh, young people or we are in may not be conducive to our well-being, in which case, you know, rather than saying to the individual, um, you know, go out and do, um, I don't know, mindfulness, I've got nothing against mindfulness, I practice that every day, or, you know, go, go for a walk. Um, Yes, there's a point, but the issue is that if I'm going to be back into this environment that's not conducive to my well-being, then what's going to happen is I'm going to start really either feeling helpless and hopeless and not wanting to engage and I'm going to be disengaged and, and not want to contribute, or I'm going to want to exit this environment because I'm really not liking it and I know that I can go and plant myself in a different environment that's going to be more conducive to my well-being and the way we do that I think is by certainly in the UK that's what I'd like to see is creating this flourishing education where we all come together we talk about a system so one of my biggest um uh, pet hate is the fact that we have a tendency to look at um, education like an engine and we're trying to make to tweak it and make it rev better but the system is not an engine it's not something physical that we can tweak it's a system that is composed of the young people and all the adults around them their parents their grandparents their friends, uh, you know, the educators, everybody else. And I really think that we all need to come together. So like tonight, this opportunity to all be together and to talk, I think it's really important because that's the way we will see change in education and bring the future of education. And I really want to finish with this image, which I took from uh, the film Harry Potter, because my message that I want to leave you with for tonight is this. 
I used to believe that I myself, and now I laugh about it because I think it's just really clearly hilarious. I used to think that I, little light, could make and change the system on my own. I tried for seven years and failed miserably. And so this image is drawn from Harry Potter when um, Dumbledore fell and obviously died and all the, the children and the wizards surrounded uh, Dumbledore and one by one, they took their wand and cast and one one wand wasn't enough to cast the light to obviously affect the dark shadow and but one by one they took that light and they made a big difference and this is what i want to leave you with for tonight is this image one light is not enough but if there's enough of us all coming and bringing our lights and shining together and I truly believe that we can make a difference and bring a better uh, system and a better education for our young people and for us, these adults. That was absolutely beautiful, Fabian. Thank you so, so, so much. I really want to go already to the questions and comments section. But uh, yeah, thank you very much. So before going that, we'll introduce our last speaker, Thais Pacheco Mandovani. She has a master's in holistic science from Schumacher College and is passionate about nature. And she co-founded co Echo University, aiming to drive, drive systemic changes through educational platforms, facilitating dialogues between different worldviews and opening space for a more regenerative human presence on the land. So welcome, Thais. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for the space and such a loving space that is being held here. So thank you for having me. And um, I would like to speak a little bit about the project I'm working in, which is called Eco Universidade, which the translation is Eco University here in Brazil, where I'm from. So I'll take you through my presentation, which is a bit about the project, our philosophy, and how do we see education, uh, the future of education, at least for higher education and here in Brazil. Let me just put this on presentation mode. So our name, uh, short name is called Eco Uni, and we, we state that we would like to be the university of the future because we um, see that there are two problems we would like to tackle whilst we are alive. Um, and, the, and the creation of the, the project goes around these two problems. And the first problem is around colonized modern education. So the, the, uh, the, system, the system education we live in now, um, which I, I would like to defer from education itself, because I think many processes of learning do exist already in different cultures, but the systemic education we live in from, from the systemic model we're in is based on competition and separation which are concepts that we are separate from nature, we're separate from each other, and it's okay for us to compete. It's not only okay, but we are incited to compete because we always have to have someone that has a higher grade or is better than someone at a certain point or is more specialist than someone in some other point. So we create this false sense of reality that humans are above natural systems and that nature is a resource. So this is something that we wanna change within the educational system here. Modern education also doesn't include the diversity of stories, cultures, and worldviews that do still exist today. So, for example, in the educational system in Brazil, there is very little uh, spoken about the point of view of indigenous society of historically what happened in Brazil through the colonization process. So this is very important to be spoken uh, in many different worldviews for uh, in higher education or for, for children in schools as well. So we understand our story from different points of view and not taken as one reality, one point of view. And most of the education system here in Brazil as well is very, um, it, it came from uh, a place which was not really the Brazilian or indigenous cultures here, which have been um, kind of pushed aside um, more and more and, and being in a violent system uh, as we speak. So what we want to do here is understand that the education from the future is not going to maintain the present. What we see from higher education in Brazil is that 
we see at, um, universities maintaining the present and creating um, young people to fit within the industry and not um, inciting innovation, creation, different, uh, different understanding of cultures, collaboration. So we want the, the, the university of the future to be based on diversity and to reintegrate uh, humans and the natural system, understanding that this comes from changing worldviews and not only creating little remedies for this uh, part of the other part. We want to dig deep and create um, something that comes from the roots, which is genuinely uh, new, but based on what we learn from our ancestors. And the second problem we would like to tackle is the climate emergency we're living in due to our own actions and our own old view and how we inhabit this planet. So we are in a climate emergency, in an ecological emergency, which is systemic from the way we see humanity uh, inhabiting the earth and which we believe is resulted from anthropocentrism, so thinking that human is above natural systems. So the fact that we're not completely aware of the impact of our actions in the, in, the, in the world, we think we are, but we are not understanding systemically the proportions we are all of what we are doing and how we are calling this uh, development. Um, and we are decreasing daily the opportunities and conditions of life for future generations, not only for humans, but there are other species as well. So we also want to tackle this problem, bringing education as uh, the center, as John said, learning within nature. So Eco University is a community-based educational platform for regenerative learning. So we learn within the community of mentors and uh, transformative agents, which are students, and we are all for different types of learning. So learnings from experience, for example. So we exist to guide people within this transition to give a more regenerative mindset and a way of understanding because we are a very rational society, but we do want to change that as well. We want to bring intuition, feeling and sensations within the ways of learning as well, and also a different lifestyle. So how can we inhabit this earth being regenerative and being part of the regenerative system? So today we offer an online community platform with a variety of courses for a regenerative transition. We work on different ways of learning. We have a diversity of sister, uh, teachers and mentors, which come from multiple worldviews, backgrounds, including knowledges that are commonly excluded, such as indigenous and Afro-descendants. We come from a systemic and a holistic approach to learning. Our goal is to connect people to nature again, because we some, some of us are, are connected, some of us are disconnected, and in our history, if you take the history of humanity, most of the time we were connected to nature, then we're not. So uh, we have this ancestral memory of being connected to the other beings, of communicating with trees and other types of animals. So we just have to access that again and start changing what we think is reality, because we create our own reality. So we offer regenerative education, which is profound and accessible. We connect people to the community and the land. We help people to understand the impact on nature and, and make changes within their lives and contribute to understanding the climate emergency and reintegrating the modern society to the ecosystems they, they are within. So basically, our goal is to um, bring humanity um, as much as we can from people who are with us within the ecosystem, understanding that nature is not here to serve us, but we are here to be part of nature and to enhance nature and to regenerate and to see how much intelligence there is everywhere that we could co-create instead of using nature as this big cupboard that we just take things and use for all our products. Our methodology is based on deep ecology. So I don't know if you guys, all of us know deep ecology, but it, I, it's one of my favorite ways of relating to nature. So deep ecology um, for indigenous people, for example, is just a way of being. They wouldn't even call it deep ecology. But here, as we are transitioning, we call it uh, the three pillars of deep ecology, which is deep experience, where we take people within nature to experience and to learn from nature. There is as much as we can to learn from each other, but there are other things that the planet and Gaia will teach us that we cannot teach ourselves. We also um, instigate people to deep question Deep question, what are the dogmas of the system? What are the dogmas that we live in? How can we be different? Go within 
dig deeper and think in other ways. We have to be questioning the one of the principles of life is change, is transformation. Everything is changing and fluctuating all the time. So we need be, to be questioning and not taking as one reality as the only way we can live, but also creating new realities and creating space for imagination and creativity. And the last pillar is deep commitment. So when you understand and you open your eyes for how you want to live the world and how you want to change the world for future generations, you need to be committed. It's not going to be easy. You're going to have to make a, a few hard choices, but it for sure it will be rewarding as to the, um, the conditions you are going to leave behind for the next generations. And we also take our principles of learning within heart, hand and hands. So we want to stimulate worldviews, we want to stimulate logic and how we understand life because we are beings that uh, draw from uh, meaning, we are sense-making people, we are deeply ritual and we come from uh, understanding and giving meaning to everything, so we want to do this. And we also acknowledge our heart, our feelings and our intuition, how we live in this world, which is there is a lot of intelligence there. But we also want to, people to be in the making with their hands and come back to actually being part of how things come into being. So here is a, a few pictures of our experiences. Uh, the things we work around is rewilding, which have a course next uh, week on rewilding. Biomimicry, regeneration, eco entrepreneurship, new economies, climate emergency, localization. We are hosting the localization event for local futures in Brazil this month and um, on June this year. Um, science and spirituality, which we believe are very connected, regenerative agriculture, bioconstruction, and sacred creativity, and much more. All drawn from the community of mentors. So our future girls is now we have a online community which we offer our courses and we connect people from all over Brazil, some, sometimes even people from um, uh, Europe or uh, Colombia also participates from our courses. We do have a land community as well, so we are an online school, but we are connected to many schools we, which are, have their physical spaces where we do our presential courses. So we are connected to the um, ecosystem of eco, other eco-universities in Brazil. And soon in the future, we're looking for investments to create our own physical space for eco-university based on maybe um, a nurse ship, for example, as John presented, but, also, but of course based on bioconstruction and the connection to land on space. So here is our contact. If you ever want to talk to us and be part of this project, I would be very happy to be with you. And I know my presentation went a little bit more around on what we're doing here in Brazil, but I really wanted you to know a little bit more of our project and how things are evolving here and what type of education we envision for the future and we're already on our hands on. So I think this is my 10 minutes and thank you very much for the space. Thank you, Thais. That was really, really beautiful and interesting. So now we have about yeah, 12 minutes for questions, comments, uh, feedback. So I'm just gonna, yeah, if you want, you can type, uh, sorry, type your questions or comments on the chat and I'll read them, or you can just unmute yourselves and post the question or the comment you'd like to post. Yeah, so every, uh, every yeah, the floor is open. Well, I, I just, I just, I'll just say as, as the only guy on the panel and, and probably the oldest person on the panel, it, it's, it's wonderful to hear. I feel like uh, a, a lot of you folks, especially Thais probably, are, are doing what I thought should be done decades ago. You know, it's like you're, you're I'm, it's nice to see uh, these thoughts really put into action. And I think the one thread that ran through all four presentations was the need of, of reorienting our relationship to nature. And um, I, you know, I've been doing a lot of reading about the Standing Rock protests in, in the United States. And um, yes, I mean, the, the, the decolonial indigenous values have so much to speak to us today. 
And that's something that people of my generation, you know, I, I couldn't have even said that probably five or 10 years ago. But, but the realization that a lot of wisdom comes from those indigenous uh, societies is, is very important. And at the same time, most indigenous people who've been partly acculturated into modern civilization might have about as hard a time readapting some of those things, some of those ways of life as, as we would, we as Anglo white guys. So it's, it's, it's uh, you know, there are a lot of challenges. I think the one thing about me, you know, then I'll give the floor to somebody else, but I, I, I love the optimism of youth and as somebody who's older and, and who's done a lot of research on how imminent some of these impacts of climate change and, and fossil fuel depletion are, I wish we had 20 or 30 years to deal with these problems, but I'm not sure we do. So anyway, I'll close with that. Thanks, John. I think I'll, yeah. I'll invite Lisa. I don't know if you want to say something. So Lisa wants to kind of maybe talk or wants us to talk. I'm not sure about the elephant in the room that's over overpopulation, so human overpopulation. Yeah. Um, well, it, it, I guess what I'm thinking is kind of obvious in a sense that if you look at the way indigenous people live and li have lived for millennia, um, They've lived close to nature. They've lived without a huge number of what we would consider amenities. Um, and they've lived with sparse populations. And there was not a climate emergency under those conditions. Uh, there certainly have been water shortages throughout the millennia, and but human populations moved to where there was water rather than saying, oh, the water here is depleted, so that's an emergency. Um, part of what I think is feeding a lot of our angst is our sense that we got to have what we have now and overcome the quote climate emergency. Uh, so some, some dealing with the, the systemic interaction of what we're calling the climate emergency and our devotion to every human child is um, sacred and must have a long and, and uh, abundant life. Those, those may be incompatible ideas. And I don't hear us talking about that as much as I think it would be useful to do. Yeah, thank you so much, Lisa, because that's actually like, the, for me, that's the reason why I want, I've invited kind of death and grief to be part of, of, of whatever project I end up, end up doing. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes I think yeah, it's just easier to focus on million beautiful possible futures, but if not, we're not acknowledging the there's going to there are there already is a lot of loss and if we're asking also people to relinquish the ways that we're accustomed to existing that's also a, a loss imagine like how much time you've invested being like a flight attendant or whatever it is that now we're calling a bad profession like mm -hmm. it just questions your whole identity and of course there's going to be a lot of grief and death and i'm still trying to figure out if there is a nice way of dealing with this i think the nice way is kind of well not the nice way but yeah for me at least learning to come to terms with the fact that a lot of us will suffer and, and, and yeah creating beautiful alternatives and futures is equally important as sitting with the loss of our ways but I, don't, we them, then, yeah. I, I don't i think if we frame it as suffering then it will be suffering if we frame it as privilege the privilege to be in nature the privilege not to be crowded the privilege to be the not to be um, overwhelmed with our stuff because we mm -hmm. succumb to the the current uh, sense that we have to have a constant growth and there's no concept of sufficiency. Um, if we frame, we can frame it so that it's it, that that what we're looking towards is loss, or we can frame it so that what we're looking towards is liberation from some of the excesses of the current society um and maybe that's that that might be helpful yes <laughs> if i may may speak to what you're saying because i think this is one of the greatest points of looking into climate emergency is that i think um one of the things for example greta thunberg said is that we cannot create solutions from the same mindset that created the problems themselves 
So I think sustaining uh, development as it is, just creating a few remedies, just yeah. to, cre to, to, to continue living the way we are. So for example, I still want to drive a car. I'm just going to create an eco car. But maybe driving cars themselves is something that we shouldn't be doing. So I think that's the most important thing we are discussing right now, which I think is the point of change, the mutation, the highest mutation point, which I think is education, because it's something that changes worldviews, is ex exchange of wisdom, of experience, of a deep connection. And I think these are the things that we should be focusing on in order to create what we so-called solutions which are not fast food solutions that we are creating within the corporate sustainable world that is going to be looking only into creating sustainable development, but it's not a development for everyone. There is not like this high well-being standards for every person in the planet. And we can talk about overpopulation and all these types of things. But I do believe that if we change our old view in a sense, as you said, that we don't need all this stuff, that we don't need to leave the way we're leaving to ha live a happy life. And sometimes we are going to be sad and it's part of life. It's like yin and yang. There's the night and there's the sun and there is winter and there is summer and everything is beautiful. And we need to understand that we are part of these cycles. And, and when the cycles of nature flourish, we flourish. And this is a type of um, paradigm shift for me that we need to have in order to change and not to create only solutions that we that in the next maybe years, th there are going to be problems again, because we're not thinking within the roots, we're not digging deep enough. So I do agree with you. I think what I would add to that is the fact that maybe we need to go deeper, like go much deeper than what we see at surface level, because that's one of the tendencies that seems to be happening. And that's what you're inviting us to do, right, Lisa, is like, it, there's so much deep down in the iceberg in terms of the paradigms and the mental models. Um, and, and being a linguist who's had to learn English the hard way, so it's not my mother tongue, I'm French, and, you know, I learned it the hard way. I really, really want to question the way we use words like the system, you know, do we hide behind words like the system? What does it even mean? Because it's easy to say, oh, we can't change because of the system. But what is effectively the system? And let's have those conversations. And yes, it's going to be challenges, challenging. And yes, it requires us, all of us to look at ourselves in the mirror. And like Lisa says, you know, we we have to sort of you know look at how we've approached things, and I love that sort of shifting the mindset to well, it's not a loss; it's actually a really positive to be. You know, I love living near the nature and the woods because I could I literally recharge every time I walk in the woods. And let's reframe that rather than living in a city. Love it. Thanks, Fabian. I'll invite one more question or comment if anybody feels like it. And if in the meantime, I'll just like raise something I think we're that's it's best what we're talking about. But Brooklyn said that he would or she would rather talk about overconsumption, -consum specifically Western exploitation of the earth. I think we've touched upon this. I don't know if anybody wants to feel called to say something more on this, but or Brooklyn, if you want to come in and say something, I'll have a couple of minutes. Yeah, I just um, like that was just kind of like a visceral reaction to the like a question to talk about overpopulation because I've grown up in the Western overconsumption and that's part of the culture that I'm trying to take responsibility for and release from. And I really related with what you said about grief and the difficulty of actually facing these things is like, I think grief is gonna be a major part of the transitions that we need to make. And, um, you know, just facing the destruction that the exploitation of the planet has done is a grief unto itself. And then letting go of um, dreams that we have that are part of the current reality, you know? And so like, for like, I haven't traveled the world and I may never, that might be a dream that I shouldn't do <laughs> because we all can't keep traveling, you know, the way that we have been. 
you know, like um, mentioning about not having a car. So, um, and that is a grief in that you don't travel very much and you are on foot, you know, but I know all the animals that live in my community because of that. So um, there are gifts in grief as well. So thank you. I live in uh, Oregon right now and I'm from Montana. Thanks, Brooklyn. Thanks for sharing. I think, yeah, unless somebody has something really pressing they'd want to share, I think it's a good place to, to close. I'd like to thank all of the speakers and also all of you guests, the ones that have participated and that have been witnessing us. It's been really, really beautiful to share uh, this hour with you. And if you'd like to, I think there's a form that we'll share if you want to give any type of feedback. And on Sunday, there's a carnival. So if anybody has poems or ideas or talents they'd like to share, you're very welcome to, yeah, to sign up and share your talents with us. And yeah, I hope you have a lovely weekend. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Marcella. Thank you. Thank you.